Well, hello, friends. Um, today, we're going to do some old school operating system stuff again. So um, a, a while ago, Sergey told me that um, Serenity runs way faster in QEMU if you enable the KVM mode in QEMU, which I guess allows it to take use uh, or make use of the um, Linux kernel's virtualization layer stuff. So the way that we turn that on is um, by passing something, let's see, down here, we'll just test it out. So you're supposed to pass dash enable KVM, um, and then running it should be very, very snappy, uh, which I suppose it is, but, but, um, GCC compilation fails. So, yeah, um, this is just a simple hello world program that um, we're crashing when we're trying to compile this, when we're running, um, Serenity and QE mode with KVM enabled. So let's get to the bottom of this because I really want to run with KVM enabled because it's so much faster. So it's obviously it's much nicer to develop if the virtual machine is faster. So um, we have a GPF or general protection fault in the GCC binary specifically in the CC1 binary, but it's just uh, one of the parts of the compiler. So um, we're crashing at some random location, but the interesting part, I guess, is the crash address right here. So this is in the kernel. We know that because the um, code segment is 8, which is when you're running in kernel mode and you're in code segment 8. Um, and let's see what's at this address. So if it's just some stupid kernel bug, that would be very nice. Uh huh. Wait. Um, this is the exception seven stuff. This is the, um, um floating point unit exception. It's interesting that we don't mention that in the um, call stack. Well, I guess that's a whole other issue, but what the heck is happening here anyway? Like you, you do something and then you get like all these exceptions one after the other. But anyway, um, the issue seems to be that we're crashing on a uh, flat floating point state restore instruction. So let's look at that. Um, exception seven. So, okay. So the way that floating point stuff works in Serenity is we're using this thing called lazy floating point um, save and restore, which uh, you know, a couple of months ago, there was this big stink about that because there's some um, security issue with using that. And I think um, all of the big operating systems, they moved to doing eager floating point state restore. But I just didn't care about it because, because um, you know, we have bigger problems than that. Uh, so well, maybe it's something we should fix someday, but not right now. So the way that we implement floating point um, say restore in the kernel here is um, whenever there's a task switch that occurs, so like when the scheduler switches between threads, we don't actually um, save and restore the floating point unit state in the CPU. But instead, we wait until um, the new thread that runs tries to do anything with the floating point unit. So And, and at that point, um, we'll get an exception from the CPU saying that, hey, 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 um, there was a task switch, and then now the new task is using the FPU. And that when we get that exception, that actually allows us to come in here and then lazily um, copy the, the saved FPU state from the um, thread object in the kernel to the actual FPU registers. So. Um, you still with me? So, so that's what this function is about. So we get an exception number seven, which means FPU exception, basically. And this is kind of a not accurate comment, I guess. Although maybe that's sort of what the name of it is. I don't know. 
Anyways, we get the FPU exception, uh, and then here the first thing we do is we clear the task switch flag. It's an Intel instruction, and this just means that we're acknowledging that um, the task has been switched because the task switch flag is um, that's the thing that causes FPU or floating point instructions to trigger the exception. So if you if you execute any floating point instruction with the task switch flag set in the CPU, then um, you'll get the exception, and that takes us here, so that we can do the e or the lazy restore. So um, let's look through the logic here. So basically, we're remembering we have a global here that remembers the last thread that was using the FPU, um, and if the last thread using it is the same thread that we are right now, like the current thread, then whatever, just return. We can ignore that. Um, but um, then the important part is here and here. So um, if there was if if there was any previous thread, then we uh, will save the current FPU state to the previous thread, um, and the FPU state here is like um, it's just a, a block of memory where we can store the FPU registers, and we just stash it away. I mean, I should have said this is a member of threads. So every thread has a storage bucket where we can keep the FPU state. Um, so this just takes the registers from the FPU, writes them into the thread storage, and then um, down here, now we say the last uh, thread that used the FPU is the current thread, and if, uh, if the current thread has ever used the FPU before, then we'll restore, um, we'll restore the current thread's FPU state by this this is a um, floating point register restore it will copy the registers from the fpu state into the fpu all right and if we have never used the fpu before in the current thread then here we um initialize the fpu for the first time basically in this thread so this will just like zero out the registers in the fpu and then um we will uh, remember that this thread has used the FPU. Um, so that's that's kind of how it works. Um, but I'm not really sure what's going on, so let's just add some debug messages. Um, let's say like current process. Um, Saving FPU state. And then we can down here we want to say that we are restoring FPU state. Actually, current process is not right here. It's this this is the thread that we're saving to, so we should do that. We're saving to the last one to use it. So basically, if only one thread is using the FPU and the whole system, then um, all that scheduling work, it never actually changes the FPU state. Um, so it's kind of nice that way. Like it, it, I mean, it's not such a big deal, and maybe we should just switch to eager, uh, say restore at some point, because I think the FPU state is like half a kilobyte. So it's just avoiding copying that back and forth. Um, so let's restore the FPU state, and then we'll also do a um, initializing FPU state. Because um, I want to see what exactly is going on here. Let's see what's going on in the background here. We can actually see that the Windows server is saving and restoring the FPU state. Uh... Hmm. Let's 
which is a little bit bizarre because it's just switching. Wait, this is weird. It shouldn't need to do this, like if it's just switching between the same process back and forth. But I wonder if it's because it's... Maybe it's because it's the thread that changes. So Windows Server has multiple threads. Let me, let me just investigate this, because if Windows Server is like... Maybe the lazy thing is not even working. Because if Windows Server is just being scheduled again and every time he has to save and restore the FPU state, then it, this whole thing is not working. Um, but now, if I if I send like the whole the thread object to the debugger, then it should print out the thread number, I think. So let's see how that looks. Uh, okay, yeah. But now we don't see the name of the process, so that's annoying. Um, but we do see the PID and the thread ID. Oh, I hate that way that that's printed, so let's change that. Um, it's here the log stream that takes a thread. We'll just change the formatting here, so we'll say um, value.process.name. Mm, and we don't have access to it. That's irritating. So I guess we can just put it out of line then. Thread CPP. Okay. Mm. Having nice debug logging is important, so let's fix this. I'm trying to. <laughs> I'm actually, I'm trying to cut down on my make parallel make jobs because I started having these like computer freezes while recording and then it desyncs the audio and the recording, which is super irritating. Um, and I've actually ordered a RAM upgrade for this machine. I was hoping to get it yesterday, but I guess it's going to show up next week. But um, I'm adding 16 gigs to it, which should definitely help because right now it only has four. Um, which, you know, is on the low end of things. Um, but uh, it's amazing that I've made it this far. Uh, only four gigs. Um, so, let's see. Here, now we can see that it's actually switching between thread zero and thread one within the Windows Server process. So that's why the FPU state has to be saved and restored. So things make sense, at least. Um, but let's see what's happening when GCC is crashing, though. Okay, so... Uh, blah blah blah, and here we launch the GCC process somewhere here, exec GCC, right? So GCC initializing FPU state in PID 17, then PID 17 saves it, and then PID 18 restores it, and then PID 18 has a problem because he crashes right here. Like this operation causes the crash, I guess. So, he's just restoring without ever having saved anything. But that's intentional because, um, because it's just a forked child, right? So, um, where do we fork? Actually, where do we exact CC1? Oh yeah, here, right, obviously. So here we exact CC1. Um, we forked here, so we this process has initialized the FPU state, and then he forks, and then executes a different process. Um, but then when the other process tries to restore the FPU state, then it crashes. Why? Okay, well, let's look at why. So, um, let's see how the FPU state is copied on fork. 
So this is where the FPU state is initialized in a new thread here. So we just um, we just kmalloc a buffer for it, and it actually has to be 16 byte aligned. Um, but uh, wait, hold on. It's a general protection fault. So actually, let's just look in the... Um, ah, where are you? CPU manual. Let's look in the CPU manual, because um, maybe we can figure out what it means to get a general protection fault from that specific instruction. So let's see, instructions. Da, 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 da. Was it F? Floating point restore. Um, this guy right here. So, wait. Ah, oh, damn it. I didn't mean to click that. How do I get the sidebar to go away? Oh, like that. Okay. So, this is the one restore FPU MMX blah 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 state. Uh, blah blah blah. Lots of text. And the exceptions. Okay. So, if we get a general protection fault, which we did. Um, right here, and the exception code is zero, obviously, which matches this, but there's no other exception code for GP here. Um, so if it's an illegal effective address in these segments, but these segments just look like they always do, it's eight in the code segment and 10 in the others, so that's fine. If a memory operand is not aligned on a 16 by boundary, or an attempt to set the reserved bits in this register thingy mini. Um, maybe the address is not aligned for some reason? Um, let's see, let's, um, let's just print out the address that we are restoring from. That would be current FPU state. And I guess we can print out what we're saving it to as well. Uh, let's see the last foo thread. Um, okay. So let's have a look. Um, okay, so what happened? Restoring FAPU state from this address. And just to, so that I am dead clear here. Yeah, of course. It's 16 um, byte align just fine. So that shouldn't be the issue. And I don't think any of these it's not one of the segments, so I guess that means that it's an attempt to set a reserved bit in the MX CSR. What the fuck is that anyway? I am not familiar with that register. Um, da -da 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 -da. Let's use the power of the internet to tell us really quick what is the MX CSR. It's the SSE control register. Oh, I'm sure I knew that at some point then, just forgot. Anyways, so I guess we're setting some garbage uh, values, but why? Because um, we should just be, let's see, restoring from this buffer right here, DEF0. So here is the parent process, the GCC process, number 17, initializing FPU state, and then he saves it here. Um, and then we fork and exec, and then restore in the child. Um, but these are different addresses. So the child obviously has his own buffer, but let's look at how it's copied over then. Um, 
where the heck is that? MFPU state. Right, so when we clone a thread, uh, which is what we do when we fork, then we clone the main thread of a process, or we clone the current thread, I guess, and then make that the main thread of a, a new process. So we call new thread, and then we copy a bunch of gunk, and one of the things that we do is we create a new FPU state buffer, and then we mem copy into the new FPU state buffer from our FPU state buffer, and then we set the has used FPU flag of the cloned thread to our flag. So that's basically the FPU setup right here. And then this is the FPU setup code. Um, but oh, wait, hold on. I feel like this this is already allocated in the constructor, no? Yeah, so the constructor always allocates the FPU state buffer, and then when we do a clone, we call the constructor, and then we overwrite that. So we're leaking. I guess when we clone a thread in fork, we're going to leak an FPU state buffer, which is size of FPU state. It's a, actually, it's kind of a chunky thing. Um, where are you? FPU state. It is 512 bytes. So I think we're leaking half a kilobyte per for every process that's spawned. Every thread that's spawned. That's pretty bad. That will accumulate over time for sure. Um, especially since it's from kmalloc, which there's only one megabyte of kmalloc ever. Um, in the current design, so um, leaking half a kilobyte for every thread spawned that puts you at what you can the, the you can you will guarantee to fill up the kmalo keep in, in like two thousand threads spawned, so that's not very good. Um, but we can easily fix it by just removing this. So problem solved, I hope. Um, and then what we do instead is that we copy the current state into the uh, cloned FPU state. So at least now we're not leaking. I wonder. I wonder if that was that was the problem because I've I've been trying to build the Serenity kernel inside Serenity, and. Um, it keeps going for quite a while, but then eventually it just chokes and dies um, somewhere during the kernel build. Um, and it runs out of memory in one way or another. And I bet you that this has been contributing to that, because like building the kernel spawns tons of processes. So hmm, if we can get this working, then we can try to do a kernel build of Serenity inside Serenity and see how it goes. Um, but Okay, so we're cloning the FPU state and we're cloning the has used FPU flag. Um, and actually, let me just see where we deallocate this. In the thread destructor, we deallocate it. Okay, that's fine. Um, ba -ba -ba so, um, back here. Okay, so when we're in the child, when we are in the child, we are inheriting state from the parent and we inherit the flag. So we'll come here the first time. This is the first time we get this exception in the child. We didn't get any of these exceptions before in PID 18. So first time we're here, has used FPU is already true. which means that we will go in this branch right here. So we don't initialize a new few state, that's fine. And then we are restoring 
from this buffer, which we've copied from the parent. And that's fine because, wait a moment. Um, but we were allocating this thing. We were not clearing that. Yeah, so let's try to do that because uh, I feel like that's definitely not the wrong thing to do. Also, why is this red here? Let me see if, oh, my queue creator is set to user land. There we go. Um, okay, so now we will um, zero that out. And let me see if that causes any different behavior. Coprocessor error. Uh huh. But wait, why would that matter though? Like, it shouldn't matter that I zero it out because we're supposed to put, um, we are supposed to save the FPU state into this thing. So I shouldn't actually even need to clear out this buffer. Uh, so why are we copying these random zeros that I put here? Why are we copying them into the FPU? So in the parent, we save the state. Wait, where do we initialize? Here, first thing is that happens. Actually, let me just copy this out into a separate file because it's kind of annoying to um, so we can see only these. Okay, so initializing state in the parent and then saving it to this address in the parent. But I think there is a race here because we're saving it here. So this is where the parent saves his FPU state for the first time. But this is where we fork and create the new thread. So we create a new thread and this is where we copy the FPU state from the parent thread to the child thread. And then here is where the parent saves his state for the first time. So the values that we copy here um, are just the um, zeros. We've never actually saved a um, valid FPU state to the um, parent's FPU state buffer. But, be he, but, 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 why does this cause a bug? Because because we also copy this flag. So the parent initializes the FPU and then sets the flag that it has used the FPU. And then in the child, when we get here the first time, we think that we have used the FPU because this was called in the parent, but nothing was ever copied into the FPU state because we never actually, we, we didn't do that before we forked and created the child thread. I th think that's why. Um, and if that is why, then the solution is to, the solution is to make sure that if this flag is true, then um, buffer, the FPU state buffer contains something valid. So when we fn init, we should also save 
whatever that whatever state that creates in the FPU will save it to the current thread's FPU state. Can we do that? Okay, well. Um, because then when the when we fork and then the child inherits the FPU state and the flag, then the FPU state will actually contain something. Otherwise, because this is lazy, it wouldn't actually contain a valid state. Let's see if that works. Because otherwise, I'm not sure what that coprocessor error was anyway. Okay. So that actually seems to work just fine. So I guess that was the problem. Cool. Yeah. Uh, no, that's 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 fine. We can. That seems like a reasonable fix. So let's just um, see thread cpp and thread h. So what was I doing here? I was adding the um, log stream operator for the printing the thread nicely and then zeroing out the fpu state at first. We can leave that in because I think that just makes sense. We don't want to take uninitialized memory and put that into the thread uh, for any reason, even though we shouldn't be copying it into the fpu. It's, let's just zero it out. It doesn't cost us much. Um, and then here I was just rearranging these. I mean, the rearrangement was kind of unnecessary, but it also at the same time doesn't matter so much. But it does make it look a little not so tidy. And I do like when it looks tidy. So there we go. So we're actually fixing a leak here. Um, zero at the FPU state. Don't allocate a new FPU state because we already got one. And then um, just fix up the operator, uh, stream operator for log stream so that logging a thread looks good. Um, let's do that, those changes first. So kernel, um, don't leak an FPU an FPU state. Don't leak an FPU state buffer for every spawned thread. Uh, this was costing a, this was um we were leaking top bytes of kmalloc memory if every new thread spawned. Mm. Um Patch fixes that, and also make sure to zero out the FPU state buffer after allocating it. Finally, also uh, makes the log stream operator for thread look a little bit nicer. All right, and then oh wait. Why is this change so big? Oh, it's realigning stuff. Mm. I don't want all these changes in my beautiful patch. Let me... Uh, I don't want that to look that way, so let me undo the change and... Let me apply this tiny little change here. So we were doing the um, FPU register save after the init. That's it. Just like that. That's such a tiny little fix. And then now we should be able to run with KVM, which is awesome because that means that my development machine gets faster for free. I mean, this is the cost, I guess. Wait, what am I trying to do? The cost is taking the time to fix this, but if that's all I have to do, that's totally cool. Um, so, kernel, um, fix, um, 
follow goes F um, accidental restore of bogus view state and forked um, uh, after fork. Um, since child processes child thread, um, forked cloned threads forked basically forked processes um, inherit both the uh, inherit the complete state of their uh, parent or origin thread. Um, we have to uh, let's say let's not say since but clone threads in here complete the view state origin thread um, but because uh, we had a bug uh, there was a bug in the lazy FPU state rest save restore mechanism where um, a cloned thread would believe it had a buffer full of valid FPU state um, because the inherited flag said so um, but the parent uh, or the origin thread had never actually copied any view state into the buffer into it. Yeah. Um, this patch fixes that by forcing out uh, if you state save um, after uh, doing the initial, if you initialize the initial initialization <laughs> um, in, it, in a new thread or in a thread. Oh, okay. F and init. Okay. I hope that future me can understand that, um, but it makes sense to me right now. So, um, and then let's edit the run script, I guess, and put I put this here on all the variants. Because there are a few different ways that you can run QEMO, like with networking, without networking, with uh, tap networking, and then we have Box, of course, the other emulator, which you can also run Serenity on, but it's super duper slow because it's um interpreter it doesn't jit anything um, and so it interprets every single cpu instruction so obviously qem can be a little bit faster with jits and now with kvm so i don't know if you can even tell actually in the um, video but this is indeed quite snappy I bet you it's going to be way snappier when I um, stop recording with OBS. So that's so cool that um, that it works. So let's try the. Um, I have um, a Serenity inside Serenity here. Let's just try to do a kernel build. Let's just see how long it takes. Um, I just realized that this might take for freaking ever, and um, I, I have no idea how long this would take. Maybe, maybe I will fast forward this, <laughs> actually, or even do a crossfade to the end. Something like that. It's definitely faster than last time I was trying to do this. So I've been doing this on and off, like um, 
do a little bit of work for a while and then try to build Serenity in Serenity again. And usually it manages to expose some interesting bugs. Um, I found a lot of issues with memory maps, for instance. Like, um, there was uh, there was this big problem with M un the M unmaps is called, where um, GCC has some kind of garbage collector in it where it would, it would allocate like a huge um, region of memory with mmap and then it would sort of selectively give back parts of that to the system by calling m on map on like little pieces of that big mapping and um, we had some issues there like um, the um, m on map implementation in the serenity kernel got really confused and um, ended up creating like invalid split regions. Um, so that's something that I fixed a while back. And um, I, th I think that was like the main correctness issue um, when building Serenity in Serenity. Um, but then there have also been like a lot of resource exhaustion issues. Like um, we had this problem in the ext2 file system implementation that you couldn't create files above a certain size, but Conrad fixed that um, recently by implementing uh, doubly indirect blocks in the ext2fs, and that's really awesome. So thank you, Conrad, because uh, I was running away from that for so long, and I'm so glad that you picked it up and uh, implemented it. So thank you. Um, what else has there been? I mean, there has been like the extremely slow disk access issue, which is, I would say, still an issue for sure. But uh, it it got helped a while ago a little bit. I implemented a new um, disk cache or file system cache, where now we have um, per file system or per disk backed file system, we have like a cache of. Um, I think 10,000 blocks that we will um, remember and then we just keep them in a um, LRU flat um, storage buffer and um, if we already have a, uh, retrieved a block before then we can just get it from the cache instead of getting it from disk and that dramatically reduced the amount of disk access that we do which um, really helps performance here because before um, before all that um, the main thing that we're doing right now is essentially loading the GCC binary over and over and over again and um, that's if you have to go to disk every time for doing that then that's really really heavy and it's actually it's getting quite far uh, and so much faster than the last time so it's interesting to see how far it can go this was as far as I got the f first time I tested it. It crashed around here. So we're doing better than that. And uh, I guess I should mention that last time I did this, it ran for over an hour. Um, but it's significantly faster this time, so I don't think we're going to have to wait that long. It was like, it would take like over a minute per file, so I just left it running while I went to get lunch one day. Um, Oh, maybe this is actually going to work. How cool would that be? Um, so, but what was I thinking? Um, I was, yeah, 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 right, the loading the GCC binary over and over. Like, obviously, that's kind of silly, because we load it once, and um, we should keep it in memory somehow. And now, at least we keep it in the disk cache, so, like, reading it from disk is really fast, but it would be nice if we could maybe even keep... The, um, keep it like around in a in a more baked state, if you know what I mean. Like uh, uh, keep the inode cached and uh, have it ready so that if a new process wants it, then like everything is ready and like the memory map is all laid out and everything. Um, that could be kind of cool. Uh, it's not something that is obvious to me how to do. In a nice way but I suspect that if I start doing it then I'll just figure out the way to do it as I go that's that's usually what happens like if I try to try to start working on something that it seems like 
unclear what a good design is, then, you know, as you mess with it, then it kind of reveals itself. I can't believe it's still going. Uh, that's, uh, uh, I know Dan, Dan Boyd, uh, Dan McDonald, who's always on IRC, always so cheerful, and he's always asking about um, self-hosting or compiling Serenity on Serenity. And if you're watching, Dan, I, I bet that you're going to like this, at least if it keeps going all the way. <laughs> ah. I don't... Man, what do I even do if it succeeds? Because um, if it gets all the way, then I will have a kernel binary. Uh, but I can't... I can't really like reboot into a new kernel from Serenity, so I would have to extract, like I would have to mount the Serenity file system and like copy out the kernel and then, um, and then copy it into my, copy it over my regular kernel in my build directory and then see if I can run that way. Which uh, would be very interesting. <laughs> I, wow, like, I'm, I'm kind of astonished that KVM is so much faster. So this really makes me wonder, like, have I just been imagining so many performance issues? I mean, the performance issues are still real. Like, even if I'm running QEMU with um, emulation mode or JIT mode instead of KVM, oh, we're out of memory, shit. All right, we didn't make it all the way. <laughs> Uh, what's this? We got so far, but we ran out of KMLOC memory for this buffer size. Crap. All right, all right, all right. But now I'm kind of interested. So, like, what if I, what if I just uh, run with fewer processes started? If I just tweak the system server to not start a um, text console, don't start a DNS server, don't start the audio server, we can live without the launcher, who needs the taskbar? Just a terminal and a Windows server. Um, I just want to see if we can go all the way. Um, but this time I'm definitely gonna, I'm gonna try again, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, fast forward to the result, and we'll see. Unused variable, blah, 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 uh, whatever. Because um, maybe it will just build. I feel like we're so close to the uh, self-hosting now, so let's, let's try it one more time. Okay, see now we have a very uh, empty process or empty machine, just a few little things running. So let's go in Serenity, kernel, and let's do time make. And I'm gonna put that here, and let's see that here. And I am just gonna Fast forward. Okay, so it looks like it actually kind of finished in a sense. It got, it got to the end and it linked the kernel and then it tries to run this little script to um, build a kernel map file, which is like the symbol table for the kernel. It's this little script here. Um, and then things just go all wrong because um, this ends up using the Serenity shell, and the Serenity shell doesn't know anything about this uh, type of stuff. It doesn't know how to do this, and uh, we have NM, but we don't have awk, we don't have unic, certainly don't have a printf, yeah, we don't have these things, right? All these things, or a lot of these things are missing. Uh, cut doesn't have dash f1. So this script doesn't work, but we did build a kernel. So oh, let's... um. Let's see if we can like uh, copy it out and um, 
and run it. So let's just um, let's just um, put that here and pull um, mount the disk image here, and then we'll just copy out the um, kernel. <clears throat> oh, actually, let me. Let me save the kernel that I have. So kernel, let's say kernel rig and um, cp and home and on kernel kernel. Um, and then I guess I'll give myself the kernel. So this is the kernel that we built in Serenity. This is the kernel from the outside. So they're not identical for whatever reason. Who knows why. But... Um, um, file format not recognized. That's a bit alarming. But it is um, an ELF 32-bit executable. Okay. And uh, I don't know. It looks a little bit like it might have some weirdness going on, but it did build. So what happens if we just try to run? That's it. It runs. <laughs> um, so it was a little bit, there's some weirdness with it, but it certainly boots. How cool is that? Okay, so we have built the kernel inside Serenity and we are now running that kernel. Um, that's super awesome. We don't have a way to, um, to like build the kernel and then replace the kernel inside Serenity. We still have to do that from the outside, but this is definitely progress. Of course, I had to I had to kill all the other processes in the system to make the build work, but it worked. We built it. Um, do I have the size program here? Let me see if, if size inside Serenity understands the kernel file. No, it doesn't. Okay, so probably something is a little off with the file, and that's some some issue that we can look into separately. But but the kernel runs, it boots, it runs, it's it's running right now. Um, that is just so neat. Um, okay, so um, wait, do I? I forgot what I was doing. I don't have any particular things that I want to commit, or do I? Oh, I want to commit this, the run stuff with the KVM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, what do I call the category here? Like, uh, build? I don't know what I call this kernel, maybe. Um, yeah. Um, make time. It's not really meta either. Well, we'll call it that. Or, uh, why is it so difficult? Build. Okay, what the hell, do I have something for this running maybe? What do I normally say when I edit the run script? Runner, okay. Have I ever said that before? Never. Okay, well I'm gonna say it again now. Okay, runner. Um, enable um, QEMU's KVM mode by default. This makes QEMU a lot faster. Um, um, uh, which is uh, run, run significant, significantly <laughs> faster. On Linux systems with KVM. Cool. Um, that's awesome. And 
we were able to build a kernel and run it. I'm gonna run it again. Look at it go. It just starts up. That's so cool. Um, so I guess that's gonna be it for today's video. Went a little uh, unexpected direction there, but that's just super cool. So <laughs> I'm happy that, that you have now actually been able to build a kernel and run that kernel. So I'm just gonna say thank you for watching and for coming here and hanging out. I hope you saw something interesting. And um, I should say welcome to all the new subscribers. There are so many new people lately and I'm really happy that um, that so many of you seem to find what I do interesting. I, I really appreciate the company and all the support. And um, I'll see you next time. Have a great day. Bye.